continue with our overview of the book of Revelation, coming to the third episode. We are the 16th of April, 2023. We're following a particular analysis of the book based on the structure of the Greek tragedy, which helps us to recognize that there may be at least five overlapping episodes of this book. We've come to episode three, which covers from the present age, starting actually with the birth of Jesus, up through the church age, into the end of time events, just before the great wrath of God is poured out. <clears throat> My learning objectives for today include to identify the woman, the dragon, and their actions, and then to identify the first and second beasts. Who, what, or where are they? And then to find the rapture in the book of Revelation. Some Christians have had difficulty finding where the resurrection of the Christians is actually in the book. I believe it is. And then to anticipate the coming wrath of God. Now, as a kind of preview of what we're going to cover here, first this is going to start with signs announcing Messiah's birth which then led almost immediately to Satan's fall from heaven, and then his war against Israel and against Jewish Christians. We'll be introduced to the two beasts, to their arrogance, and hopefully to their identity. We will see a view of Jewish Christians gathered around Jesus in the heavenly place, and the danger of the death of all Christian believers during these ages. Then the Son of Man coming in clouds to harvest the earth just before the wrath of God is poured out on many nations. We're going to start with a view of God's temple opened in heaven. Now remember episodes always start with activities in heaven that get expressed on earth and will bring us back to praise being offered to the God of heaven. Then. God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. Have you ever lived in a country that had lots of thunderstorms? In my country. Rain is a blessing of God, except in Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Heaven is open, and to whom? To believers. To believers. John in particular, but when the heaven is open, then those who are on earth and qualify, they can be received into heaven. As we start the next episode, heaven will be shut for a period of time. Now, what is this Ark of God's Covenant up in the heavens? I thought the Ark of the Covenant was made of wood, covered with gold, and kept in the tabernacle, and then later was buried by the prophet Jeremiah in a secret cave. So what are we talking about? The ark was always buried down here. It was a representation on earth of what is in heaven. Yahweh had instructed Moses to make the tabernacle according to the pattern of the things in the heavens. Well, remember, everything that describes heaven is given to us in symbols, in tropes, and in figurative language. Why? It's pretty hard to describe spiritual things we've never seen. In any event, God keeps his covenant, and there's a copy of the covenant in his mind. Of course, most of it is already found in the Hebrew scriptures. What would these particular signs, these flashes of lightning and so forth, what would those mean to pagans living on earth? And like anger at the gods. Perhaps the gods are angry. Anyway, they're stirring. There's something going on in the heavens. We better be careful how we behave down here. We come then uh, to the account of the woman and the dragon. Chapter 12. And a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman, clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant, and was crying out in birth pains 
and the agony of giving birth. Bible interpreters uh, in the, let's say, after about the second or third century until the 20th century didn't really know what to do with this, they assumed, this vision that John had seen. And so there was a great deal of guesswork as to what it represented. What does this woman mean? In the earlier centuries, the Christians, they knew what it was talk John was talking about because the memory of the signs in the heavens, that is to say the constellation of stars and planets, was recognized by astronomers in the east who saw the signal and they came to Israel looking for the newborn king of the Jews. And in the 20th, late 20th century, especially the last two decades, we have had such accurate astronomy software that we can actually now have it run backwards and show us where every star, every planet, the sun and the moon were at every hour of every day, going back for centuries and centuries. And so I installed in some of that software on my computer a couple of years ago, a free version, ran it backwards, and what did I find? Well, it was a screenshot of what I found. Uh, it was a constellation of the, uh, the sun and the moon and Jupiter and Regulus and 12 stars located around what we'd call the head of the constellation Virgo, the Virgin. And so the ancients, they recognized that as some kind of a sign, especially with the king planet and the king star aligning together. It's like, uh oh, this is a king thing. Well, John now, he recalled that and he is reminding his readers, who were Jewish Christians for the most part, remember, Messiah came. And at that time, Messiah appeared. So, we're probably dealing here with astronomical data, as John would describe it from the view of someone on earth looking into the sky. So, who is the mother here? Is it Israel, who gave us Messiah? Or is this the Virgin Mary, who actually birthed the infant? Or is this the Roman Catholic Church? Well, some have said it has to be Mary, because Mary gave it. However, as we go on in the account, we find that Satan chases the woman. And she actually has to take refuge out in what's called the wilderness, and will eventually be nourished for three and a half years, which signals end time events. So we're probably talk, talking about Mary, since she's been safe up in heaven since two millennia ago. So then it would and be Israel. It's probably Israel. Anyway, uh, she was suffering with birth pangs. Birth pangs was a Second Temple era expression of the troubles that would happen on earth before the arrival of Messiah. And so by using that language, John again is signaling to his readers we're talking about the real Messiah who has come. And many of the difficulties that arrived to the early Christians in the first century can be attributed to Satan's hatred of Israel. She gave birth to a male child, one who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne, and the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. What do you observe? Particular interest? A child ruling with a lot of iron. Uh, That's usually a bird picture for the Messiah. By the Messiah eventually ruling over the nations, which is very explicit here. But where is he today? In Mula. He's in the wilderness. Yeah, he's been, he has ascended into the heavens. He's been taken up. And so he has not yet begun to rule with the rod of iron because he has a lot to accomplish. Any questions about the wilderness? Uh, a lot of Israelites escaped into the wilderness, away from dictator, rulers, and things like that. This, this is probably a, a place out of, out, of the, out of the big cities where you might fall under, under that rule. Yeah, so the wilderness for many was outside of the boundaries of Israel. Israel has had to leave the land. Anyway, we have in this paragraph 
a reference to distant history to the present history as then experienced up to our day and future history which seems yet to come. And then we'll ask what is this wilderness? So, distant history, Jesus came and is ascended into heaven. Of course that blends into present history. And into what's going on in the present time? Well the woman is now, is currently in the wilderness. And the future history is when she will have to be especially protected and nourished during the 1,260 days of the end time events described in the book of Revelation, which of course borrows from the descriptions of the end times as revealed in the Hebrew prophets. So, the wilderness, here's my guess, these are the Gentile nations, where you have a reference such as Ezekiel 20:35 which makes out other countries and peoples to be a place where Israel can actually dwell. Now, has it been easy for Israel out in the wilderness? Has she been well treated? Not always, but yes, for the most part. If you study the history of the Jews in Europe, you'll find that they were a protected class because they provided two very important services to the Gentile nations, especially the Catholic nations. The first was, it was against the law in most of Europe for most of, of the centuries to produce alcohol because it's forbidden in scripture. So the Jews were allowed to brew alcohol and they made, they made a good living at it. And the second was, the, since the scripture forbade the taking of usury on money that is lent, <laughs> the Europeans found it difficult to do profitable banking. So they allowed the Jews to become bankers, who would then lend to the Gentiles for usury. Even in our own country to this, to this day, it seems that almost every profession that requires intelligence is dominated by people of Jewish descent. All right. The text talked about the rest of her offspring, not national Israel in this case. Then the dragon became furious with the woman, and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God, and hold to the testimony of Jesus. The rest of her offspring are those Jewish people who became followers of Jesus. And we know that First century, the Christian movement was primarily Jewish. The Jewish Christian mission to the Gentiles was more vigorous and more important than that of the Apostle Paul himself. The, the Jewish movement, mission movement, primarily went to Jewish communities in every, every other country. So Paul was one of those Jewish believers who saw the importance of winning the Gentiles if, if this movement is really going to succeed and fulfill the promise that Yahweh had given to Abraham to bless every nation on earth. So when Paul would talk about the promise of God, that's usually what he had in mind. So, I take it then, the rest of her children, her offspring, are the Jewish Christians. Because these are those who both keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. So these are Followers of Jesus were still oriented to the Hebrew Bible and the commandments of God. They saw in Jesus the power and the spirit necessary to live in obedience to the law. Whereas the Gentiles, who never had the law, were never required to adopt the law, but rather to be filled with the Holy Spirit and follow the commandments of Jesus. But these believers, they're doing both. So the commandments of God and the testimony about Jesus, or the testimony that Jesus gave. <clears throat> so, the Gospels. Just to orient ourselves, remember that Daniel especially, but Ezekiel and other of the prophets, they talked about the Gentile nations in terms of the empires, because Israel had to live under imperial oversight and domination throughout all of its existence. It was hardly a century when Israel was not paying taxes to an imperial authority. And most of those centuries, Israel was dominated by which empire? It's not even listed here. Egypt. But then we had the, eventually in the 
The seventh century BC, the rise of the Babylonian, what we call the Neo-Babylonian Empire. That been, there had been an earlier Babylonian Empire, but it had pretty much disappeared and what was revived. And so, secondly, uh, Daniel said the Babylonian Empire, in which he served, would be replaced by the Medo-Persian Empire. And eventually it was. <clears throat> by the way, uh, the Medianites, do they still exist? A friend of mine who is an Arabic, Hebrew, Kurdish speaker said very much so. He said, all Kurds know that they are the Medianites and that the Iranians are the Persians and that most of Iraq is actually Iranian in sympathies and in descent and therefore Persian. All right? Persian Empire, Daniel said, would be conquered by the Greeks and that the Greek Empire would quickly be divided into four vast regions of imperial authority, which would then give way to the Roman Empire, which would be all-consuming. So the Romans, they went after the, all of the world, as much as they could get to during their centuries, and eventually all of Europe, as well as the, mid, the uh, Middle East. Rome fell in the 8th century AD, but the Roman Empire continued on for another thousand years. It changed its capital from Rome to where? Byzantium. Byzantium. Constantinople. The city of Constantinople, right. So that empire was conquered and absorbed by the Islamic movement, and which still holds it to this day. That Roman Empire, it, it did suffer a kind of death, but it, it continued, it lived again. But then this would be replaced by Messiah's kingdom. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. This is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So all of the readers of the book of Revelation in the first century, they knew this material. They were familiar with it, and they knew what John was talking about. Daniel called these empires beasts. And so in our book of Revelation, what do we see? The first beast that rises out of the sea. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on earth will worship it. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Uh, did this ever happen? Well, yes. <laughs> uh, we're talking primarily here about the, the Roman Empire which then would have its further expressions through the Islamic Empire, which still controls much of uh, the Middle East and Southern Europe to this day. Over every tongue, and language, and nation, at least in that region. So what are Christians supposed to do about this? Endure. Endure. Keep the faith. Do not deny Christ. Is it possible to endure under an anti-Christian government? Yes. I've been to places like the Sudan, where the Christians were being rounded up, taken out into the desert in trucks and dumped, knowing that they could never make it back alive. And so they endured. They did, for the most part, they never denied Christ. You might also argue life was so tough it wasn't worth living anyway, but they had family for whom they would like to live. Well, again, we have references here to the distant past, the present age, and the second coming of Christ. What, do, what is the distant past? Did this beast ever conquer a people called the saints and conquer them? Now remember in biblical language, in the New Testament epistles of Paul, the saints are all Christian believers. But in the context of Second Temple Judaism, I take it therefore going into the book of Revelation, the term saints is primarily a reference to God's chosen, therefore, holy people, Israel. Even though many of them lived in rebellion or in idolatry, the people are the saints. When Daniel wrote that it already happened, did it ever happen again? Titus, when the Rome conquered right, under, Jerusalem and all. Under Emperor Vespasian, his son, General Titus, did intact 
in fact, invade Israel and for about seven years, it was a long process, subdued every city in the country, slew hundreds of thousands, possibly over a million were slaughtered by the armies, eventually surrounded Jerusalem. And Jesus had said, when you see the army surrounding Jerusalem, get out, don't stay around. God is going to shorten the time, lest all flesh perish. That's what the Christians did. They packed up and got out of Jerusalem, if they could. And so, yes, this fact did happen. And then the, uh, the Roman Empire continued to spread across not only the region, but most of the Roman soldiers who were so willing to slaughter Jews and took delight in slaughtering the infants and tearing down the temple, they were not from Rome. Where were they from? They were recruits from Moab and Ammon and Edom. They were brought in as recruits from the colonies surrounding Judea, ancient enemies of Israel. Distant past, the invasion, the invasion of Israel in the first century CE, and in the present age, the Roman Islamic Empire continues and will go right into the end of times. Now we're looking for the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Meanwhile, <clears throat> we are to endure opposition with faith, and especially those who are in the region. Would you like to be in Israel today, right now, with Iran threatening not only to invade, but uh, maybe to drop a few nuclear bombs on them, with the new Intifada going full steam, with Rockets, there's no shooting off rockets that don't just go up and sputter and fall down to the ground, but actually can destroy. Um, what if you're a Christian living in Israel today? The Israeli Supreme Court has put new restrictions on the Israeli Christians' right to talk about Jesus in public. Then what I saw another beast, beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns, like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence. you see any contrast with the first beast? The first beast arose from whence? Sea. From the sea. And the sea in scripture typically represents what? Well, some say the nations, it can include the nations, but for the most part the sea is all the chaos in creation caused by the satanic rebellion, which of course includes Gentile nations had two horns like a lamb. Well, what do you suppose uh, it's trying to act like? Well, what would a lamb mean to Jewish Christians? The Messiah. The Messiah, crucified. So is this the Antichrist? I think you're onto something. So, oh, and it rises uh, out of the earth. Well, what would the earth, the same word for land, what does that suggest to you? Governments. A human person? A human person arising out of the land of Israel. Therefore, likely, the Antichrist will be of Israeli or Jewish origin. Not, I don't know for sure, because land can also refer to the surrounding nations in, the, in that region. Especially since Israel eventually was promised by Yahweh would eventually occupy all the land up to the Euphrates River. But that land, historically and to this day, is occupied by enemy nations. It's never been fulfilled, except maybe briefly under Solomon. Anyway, it exercises the authority of the first beast. In other words, this local Israeli conquering false messiah, who will rule over surrounding nations as well, he's empowered by Satan. All right, so we're suggesting here earth, possibly the land, maybe Israel or nearby nations, the religion at this time would likely be Islam or Islamic approval. And others are wondering, well, is it the World Evangelical Forum and the BRICS nations who are setting up the system for them, even as we speak? Do you mean the World Economic Forum? What did I say? Evangelical. Evangelical. Right, the World Economic Forum. Like the Lamb, likely a false messiah, the authority, is from the New World Order, as some like to call it. And so this individual may be one of the 
World Economic Forum Young Leaders, if you're familiar with that concept. No one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast, or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six, six, six. Or as some ancient manuscripts read, 616. The manuscript evidence is about equal. Right? I think you could make some observations. Are we talking here about an idea, about a government, oppression in general, or are we possibly talking about a human being? Does the text give us any hint? Well, it sounds to me like it's a, an economic system. It includes it. If you can't buy or sell. You know. But this beast itself. Is it a system or a human person? It's the number of a person. And it's an identifiable person who has a real name. But if you're fond of uh, Judaica, then you are familiar with the practice of gematria, right? All right? I suggest this is a person. He's actually called, the word for person here is the Greek word anthropos, as in anthropology, and always means a human being. And the reason. This is possibly talking then about the end of times Antichrist. Although the Christians, at the time this was written, they had another leader in mind. They thought they identified the leader that John was talking about, who would be, would be the first beast and not the second beast. If you were a Greek speaker and reader, and you performed a numerical analysis of the name of the Emperor Nero, the value would be 666. However, if you were a Latin speaker and you added up the letters for the name, it would come out to 616. And those who were making copies of the New Testament, if they were from a Greek community, they wrote 666. If they were from a Latin speaking community, they wrote 616. Same referent value. Here's how it works. Every <coughs> letter in the out Latin alphabet has a numeric value. Uh, if you're under 50 years of age, you learn to read Roman numerals in school. They don't do that anymore. Your grandchildren have no idea in the world what these numbers mean. Uh, they did the same thing in the Hebrew language, different letters, and they assigned numerical values to each Hebrew letter. And some places where you have numbers mentioned in the Hebrew Bible, they're not written out as as numbers, they're just Hebrew letters used as numerals. Highly susceptible to mistakes during copying. And this is how you get a giant who is 13 feet tall. Well, the Hebrew letters got inverted. He was really about 7 feet tall, as conserved in the, uh, in the Septuagint version. All right, Greek letter, Greek alphabet, same kind of thing. So if you do the gematria of Nero Caesar in Greek, from Greek to Hebrew, his Greek name is Neron Kaiser. Transliterate that into Hebrew characters, add, it up, add up the letters, they come to 666. But you can do the same thing in Latin. In Latin he was called Nero Kaiser. Transliterate into Hebrew, add up the letters, comes to 616. But just in case the Antichrist is going to be a Muslim, we may have to figure it out from Arabic or from the Farsi alphabet, Farsi being the major language of the Persians, the Iranians, same alphabet for the Iraqis. We may have to figure out his name from that. Anyway, I verified this whole system from this Jewish site. Now, next view, Jewish Christians in heaven. Then I looked. And behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000, who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Okay, there was the Lamb. Well, where was the Lamb? Where is the Lamb? Where is he located? In the heavens. So these folk who are standing around the Lamb, where must they be? But why is it called Mount Zion? Is it Mount Zion? That's a hill near the city of Jerusalem. These have been redeemed from mankind as firstfruits for God and the Lamb, and in their mouth no lie was found, 
for they are blameless. So the, the first Jewish Christians, they had it the hardest. They were the ones who had, had to escape for their lives out of Jerusalem. They were being hunted down in many places. Many of the early Christians, Jewish Christians, however, became fiery evangelists. Many of them went on missions to other nations. They were devoted to Jesus Christ. So John says, at the present time, we're looking into the near future, the Jewish Christians who are suffering so badly, they get to go be with Jesus, which is far better, Scripture says. Now, in, in the Bible, the term Zion is actually used at least five different ways. First, it's a hill. Secondly, the entire city of Jerusalem is sometimes called Zion. Or, those who live, live in the city, who have faith in Yahweh, who are the redeemed, they are sometimes called Zion. But then, in the book of Hebrews, the heavenly Jerusalem, which has not yet come to earth, is called Mount Zion. And in the future, when the heavenly city will come down to earth, it will be called the New Jerusalem, also Mount Zion. Here's what you do as a Bible student. You look at, you list all of the possible meanings of a word, then you come to your verse and you ask, which of the possible meanings seems to be the one used here. The one, two, three, four, or five. Number four, that's the one that fits. And so we would exclude the others, at least tentatively, as possible, possible meanings. In any event, what we have then is a view of the intermediate state, that is, where the believers consciously go when they leave their body. In any event, a time will come when Evangelism will no longer be legal or safe. There won't be any Christians around to do it. Yahweh is going to send an angelic beings around the earth with a threefold message. Uh, here's the first thing they have to say. Fear God and give Him glory, because the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water a call to leave your false gods, leave your atheism, leave your beast worship, and fear God, give Him glory. He's about to bring the whole system under judgment. Worship Him. Remember the springs of water? There, many of them have already been defiled. All those springs, God made those. He owns them. All right? The second angel has a further message. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. She who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. So the next episode will pick up on this, this particular message, Fallen is Babylon the Great. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day or night, these worshippers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. All non-believers will want to receive the mark so that they can buy and sell and survive in the end time system. If you really submit to that system and don't repent and give glory to God, here is your destiny. The Jewish Christians and the other Christians whom you slaughtered, they're with Jesus. Your destiny is something else, where the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. So what are we to do? If not, remain faithful at all costs. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. We're suggesting that the saints will actually be gone by now, and so this is a call to the saints who are reading the book. At any point in history, our task is endurance. Keep the commandments of God and to hold fast to faith in Jesus. If you're Jewish, you'll probably want to keep God's commands. If you're a Gentile, you'll want to keep Jesus' commands. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. From now on, I take it to be in the time of John, on through the centuries, up until the end of time. You will rest from your labors, for your deeds follow you. So we notice we have a reference here to commandments, 
to deeds and to labor. So, what does the Christian life consist of? Is it just believing in Jesus and collecting shells on the seashore? Following Jesus' commandments. Um, right, following his commandments. Working hard, performing good deeds when we have opportunity. And most Christians do as they mature. Faith in Jesus, okay, we have this, um, whenever you see the phrase, faith of Jesus, it's ambiguous in English. Faith in Jesus can either mean the faith that we have in him, towards him, or it can mean faith like Jesus' faith. He was faithful to the Lord, we should be faithful to the Lord. Or it can mean Jesus' faithfulness unto death, whereby we are redeemed. So, leave it to you to decide. But many scholars recognize that John, who wrote the Gospel, if he's the same one who wrote the Revelation, he was a master of using ambiguity in all of its meanings at the same time. He wanted you to stop and reflect. What could faith of Jesus possibly mean? Well, that's what I was thinking, all of the above. Yes! In chapter 14, then, the rapture bus finally arrives. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and seated on the cloud, one like a son of man, with a golden crown on his head, and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. Who is this? Who is this one like a son of man? The son of man. It is the son of man. Who did Daniel say would come riding in on a cloud, looking like a human being? Well, that's what he said. I, in my visions, I saw someone riding on the clouds, and it was a son of man from all I could see. And yeah, that's all I could see. He was the Messiah. Yeah. He was foresight. He was foreseeing Messiah, <clears throat> wearing a golden crown, meaning he's, he's a king, and a sharp sickle in his hand. All right, but it says here, another angel. Does that mean the Son of Man is an angel? I'm thinking this could be, yes, like, like in the Old Testament, this could be the angel of the Lord sending the command because only God knows that day that he sends his Son. Okay. All right, before verse 14, there are several angels mentioned. <clears throat> then the Son of Man arrives, and then in verse 15, we, we turn back now to the role of the angels. But if indeed this one, the Son of Man riding on the cloud, is the Messiah, why does he need an angel to come tell him that it's time now to harvest the earth? Doesn't he doesn't need an angel? Jesus, Jesus said that he didn't know the hour till his father told him. Precisely. So apparently, his father yeah, was you're right, him. both of you. And that is, Jesus didn't need it, but the Father now sends the message to the Son of God, say, it's time, do it. He has returned in the clouds, and now he can start the harvest. One of the questions of eschatology is how much delay between Jesus appearing in the sky and the actual resurrection of all the believers. It could be hours, days, weeks, possibly even months. As Jesus said, when you see the Son of Man appearing in the clouds, Start looking up, because your final redemption, your resurrection, is drawing near. So verse 16, So the one who sat on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. Where did this, I, this metaphor of reaping, where did that come from? Who actually talked about resurrection in terms of reaping? Well, Jesus did. Jesus did. And so... Now, those who cannot find the resurrection of the saints in the book of Revelation are looking for the language of the Apostle Paul. They want to find 1st and 2nd Thessalonians in the book of Revelation. But John never quotes Paul. He quotes the prophets and he quotes Jesus. And so he uses Jesus' own language, his return in the resurrection of the saints. However, there is a second reaping that is to come. Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. 
Now, this is not the Son of Man. This is another angel. Ed? All right. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. There are two end-time harvests. First, the surviving saints, in verses 14 and 16, and the second harvest, those deserving of the wrath of God, in verses 17 and 20. Very brief statement, but it will be elaborated in the next episode. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. For a 1,600 stadia, or the old version, furlongs. Uh, so I had to look this up. Uh, Wikipedia was very helpful. 16 stadia, just over 300 kilometers, or about 200 miles, which happens to be both the ancient and the modern length of the province of Judea, which today we call the land of Israel. Hmm, just saying. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. In this episode, we have seen the birth and the ascension of Jesus, the Messiah, into the heavens. Then how Satan pursued Israel and continues to do so while she is uh, currently, for the most part, still safe out amongst the Gentile nations. There was the rise of the beast empire and towards the end, the Antichrist, leading up then to the, the rapture, that is, the resurrection of all believers from off the earth to be saved with Jesus in the heavens just before the seven ending plagues start. So our next episode will be a seven. But in scripture, we, we have to deal with it. All right.